Hello and welcome to the COM300 module on social movements. You had to know this was coming. Our objectives for this module are to distinguish between social movements and other collective groups and between different stages of a social movement. Second, to discover the variety of rhetorical perspectives and terms that can be applied to analyze social movement rhetoric. And third, to assess how social movements in general and PETA, in particular, uses identification as a primary visual and textual strategy to gain support. As usual, you're responsible for the working vocabulary. How do we define social movement, and what are some examples? Well, the Christensen reading says that it's an organized, yet informal, social entities that are engaged in extra-institutional conflict that is oriented towards a goal. That's pretty general, but it includes um, informal kinds of associations, not governmental, for example. And it's extra-institutional conflict, which means that um, it is uh, coming into conflict with some of the aspects of our current institutional structure, whether it might be civil rights or it might be um, uh, gay marriage or um, some other kind of movement. Right? So various examples include some that we're relatively familiar with, the civil rights movement, um, the animal rights movement, um, some that are m more recent, uh, Black Lives Matter, and uh, um, so there's a variety of these things. I think the question becomes, you know, how do we distinguish between a social movement and like a fad or a spontaneous protest or even a branch of government, right? So. So Stuart um, et al. talk about this and they say that a social movement has clearly identifiable leaders or um, followers. So something that we might call the men's movement uh, fails this test because it, it doesn't really have a clear identifiable um, set of leaders um, and clear uh, set of followers or organizations that make up that movement. Um, so it's not clear that the men's movement is a social movement. Second is that it's large in scope and impact over time. It's, uh, it's, it's not a pressure group, it's not a, it's not a lobby, um, a pack, or um, even a cult. Um, and it's certainly not an isolated protest, um, some, something that happens that uh, um, people spontaneously erupt and then after that's over, well, then it's kind of done. Third is that it can contain multiple organizations. So there's, there's many situations where an organization um, is, uh, is part of a larger social movement. Um, so when we talk about something like the animal rights movement, um, then we see that there are, there are various organizations, PETA is one of them, that operate within that sphere, right? A social movement generally isn't just associated with one organization. Um, it will um, often spawn several, um, and that's one way that we can tell there's an ongoing social uh, pr trajectory movement forward um, in this area, is that we have a variety of, uh, of uh, organizations. And, of course, uh, fourth is that it remains un uninstitutionalized. It's not part of the government. Um, it's not part of an established order that gets to set what the norms and what the values are. Um, so it's usually protesting um, in some way um, against that or for um, certain changes, right, towards a goal. So what are the, some of the stages, then, that we, uh, uh, that we use to describe the life of social movements? Uh, this is important because often the rhetoric will vary over the stages, okay? Um, so the first stage that uh, um, uh, is talked about in the Christensen article is emergence. This is where we have kind of what they, he would describe as social ferment. Uh, there's uh, little to no organization. The actions are not strategic. There's nothing collective. There's just a strong sense of discontent. People are ticked off about something, um, and uh, they're still pretty diffuse in the in the emergence stage, right? Um, so in the 1950s, there was civil unrest about the civil rights, but nothing coalesced until the decision uh, in Brown versus Board of Education um, that 
you know, outlawed segregation. And then at that point, um, there was a, enough of a focal point and enough um, power um, emerged into it, and, and it began to, um, to, uh, um, to emerge. The second stage is coalescence. Um, as opposed to just sort of people being ticked off, coalescence is where um, the issue becomes more popular. It's more clearly defined um, in terms of what are we angry about or who are we protesting against. Um, the uh, unrest becomes a little more overt. Um, it's not so much um, you know, behind the scenes. It becomes more prominent. Um, and uh, you get, begin to see the emergence of leadership where um, there are demonstrations, there are clear leaders um, of some sort or another, and, uh, um, and you begin to see kind of the outline. So, um, so in the 1960s, um, the civil rights movement became more organized, and it began campaigns uh, like the Montgomery bus boycott, um, and we got you know, the march in Selma and so forth. So that was where leadership emerged and it began to coalesce. The third stage, after a bit of time, is bureaucratization. So this is the formalization stage, where more and more um, it becomes uh, an organization and coalition-based strategies. It's not so much one group of people as it is you know, different groups of people, and they're trying to coalesce and negotiate their power in the social movement. So um, this often is, is signaled by a shift to trained staff people who um, are hired because they are experts at uh, um, uh, nonprofit mobilization or um, getting uh, people out to, to vote or to be engaged in some way. So um, if, it, if it doesn't bureaucratize, if it doesn't become um, a little bit more professional, right, it's not so much um, the initial emotional excitement once we get to bureaucratization. Um, it becomes more of a sustained effort uh, and more formalized. So um, if there's no bureaucratization, then often the movements will just kind of drift away um, and, uh, and it never becomes, um, you know, solidified as a continuing um, dominant force um, like civil rights became, right? So. Okay, and then finally decline. There's a number of ways that social movements decline. Um, one of them is repression. The government harasses them, um, they jail them um, until they break up. Um, you could say the Black Panther movement um, was the victim of governmental uh, repression. The second is co-optation. Um, this is where um, industry just kind of buys off the movement. Some of the leaders get get put on um, boards of uh, organizations or companies and um, and so you know they get co-opted they get kind of um, sucked into the system and uh, are no longer um, really um, fighting for their cause and that's a that's a, a decline a third is of course success um, one of the um, one of the success stories in this area from a social movement perspective is when Disney wanted to come in and put a large um, Disney History Park, uh, and uh, um, and for you know a lot of different people, they hadn't thought it through or crunched the numbers or were unwilling um, to put money into road improvements, um, and so you got bumper stickers like um, uh, Interstate 66, Disney's new parking lot, uh, and uh, and after a time um, they were successful and they um, they forced Disney to rethink its plans and not um, locate their next theme park. Um, right off of Interstate 66. Um, <clears throat> uh, failure um, happens. That's a fourth way that they can decline. Um, and, uh, um, and that means oftentimes that they either split into divisive little factions or that, um, that a small elite kind of becomes isolated away from the mainstream movement. Um, this happened with uh, Earth First to some degree. Um, they were uh, part of the environmental movement, but they were pretty extreme um, and advocated for ecotage and property destruction and um, ways to stop growth um, that were criminal. Um, and so they kind of became isolated a little bit in the environmental movement um, because uh, they were too extreme for the bulk, the center part of that movement. 
And finally, fifth, um, they can become established in mainstream society. Um, you may not think of them, the unions uh, uh, are part of that process. Uh, AFL-CIO um, started off as a fledgling um, gathering around the, the country to um, protest labor conditions. And then after a while, they, they simply became a large, standing, powerful force in our society, and they became institutionalized. So how does rhetoric contribute to the life of a social movement? What, what is the deal with analyzing rhetoric and social movements? So the, the short answer is, it takes a variety of methods. Um, social movement, per se, is, is not really a critical method. It's like a subject matter. Um, and it's constrained a little way because the, the rhetoric isn't just one person. The, the rhetoric is usually um, several leaders, um, maybe um, popular folk artists, or um, you get Joan Baez to come in and, and play some songs and, and, uh, and do a protest thing. And, and so um, there's different kinds of rhetoric that are associated with social movements. It's usually not just one speaker um, at one time uh, or um, even, even one single organization. There's a lot of different voices in social movements. And that kind of changes how you do uh, analysis. So we look at, you know, of course, slogans, uh, bumper stickers, right? Interstate 66, Disney's new parking lot, um, a very effective um, slogan, I thought. Um, and then songs and marches, uh, camping out like the Wall Street, Occupy Wall Street, uh, signs, buttons, icons, symbols. Um, there's a whole raft of things that social movements do and different kinds of rhetoric that they use. When we start to analyze, what perspectives do we use to analyze social movements? Well, any perspective we've studied this semester. Okay, so that includes classical. You can look at ethos, pathos, and logos, style, and so forth. It includes things like the language and metaphor, um, maybe cluster criticism of some of the rhetoric of the, the social movement, um, genre. We haven't talked about yet, but there's narrative and dramatism uh, and uh, mythic criticism, gender criticism, ideology um, criticism. And so um, you can use any of those lenses to kind of help tease out what's happening with the rhetoric in a social movement. The Atkins Sayers article on PETA. So what's their formula for publicity? And what stage uh, is the uh, animal rights movement? Well, their publicity formula is 80% uh, um, outrage, 10% celebrity, and 10% truth. Uh, and uh, um, so if you've gone to the PETA website, then you know that uh, that uh, celebrity is true and the outrage is true. Um, it's a little less clear um, uh, you know, how much of it is actually truth, but 80% outrage and 10% celebrity, it probably isn't far off. What stage does she talk about the animal rights movement being in? She sees it as in the bureaucratization movement, where um, the website, the staff is very professional. Um, they are, um, it's no longer a kind of a mom and pop organization. Now it's, uh, um, there's lots of lobbying that goes on um, uh, on Capitol Hill. The website, uh, uh, the year she wrote the article, had 50 million visitors. Uh, and uh, there was over uh, 3,300 interviews of, uh, of PETA members and so forth. So um, they had a budget upwards of $31 million. Clearly we're not talking about a fledgling, new, just emerging or just coalescing animal rights movement here. We're talking about clearly bureaucratized. And so how, how has PETA managed to create a sense of identification? Now, well, of course, their big issue has to do with um, animals and, and humans being able to identify with animals. So the, their campaigns are many, many, many. And, you know, you might identify with Alicia Silverstone. She's a vegan. You might identify with uh, um, people who are, um, you know, cautioning us about buying fur and all that kind of stuff, right? There's celebrities that do a lot of that. Um, but when we, when we identify with animals, PETA uses several strategies. One is to put humans in the cage so that you see the human in the cage looking out at you, right? 
Um, and that's powerful because then we see ourselves in that situation and we know we don't like being in cages. Um, another is to figure out how to break down the barrier um, between animals and humans. So one of the important things are the eyes, right? We see the eyes of the animals who are um, feeling pain or being um, uh, used to uh, test for cosmetics or you know whatever the, the particular issue is and that that you know gateway to the soul is part of the rhetorical power of some of the human animal identification um, so um, you know there's a there's a variety of ways but essentially um, uh, the people are identifying either with an animal or with a celebrity or they're identifying against um, uh, someone who is being exploitive, someone who is bashing baby seals, for example. Um, we, we would identify against that person. Um, or in some of the early, you know, throwing blood on people wearing fur, you know, we identify against the rich person wearing the fur with uh, the endangered or the, the animal skins on their back and so forth. So I want you to review the PETA website, and particularly the video testing one, two, three, and um, identify uh, what do you think are the dominant rhetorical strategies, classical or otherwise, that are apparent in this short video. So identification, logical argument, emotional, um, ethos, right, um, stylistic language usage, you know, how the video is presented. I want you to talk about that. And then post this. Give another example of a recent social movement that's used rhetoric and, uh, um, and has sustained its identity and purpose moving forward. You know, talk a little bit about the, the social movement and how it uses rhetoric to advance its aims. And that's all for now. Have a great day and blessed be.